And Samuel said to Saul, you have acted foolishly. You have not kept the commandments of the Lord your God, which he commanded you. For now the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. They tell me I'm not being heard. Can you hear me now? I was better off before. <laughs> but your kingdom shall not endure. The Lord has sought out for himself a man after his own heart, and the Lord has anointed him as ruler over his people, because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. 1 Samuel 13, 13, and 14. You know, one class I remember when I was in college was college comp. It was another thing I didn't enjoy real well. <laughs> but I remember the one thing my teacher taught me, and she ran it into my head over and over and over again. Tell people what you're going to tell them. Then tell them. And in the end, go back and tell them what you told them. So right now, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you. All right? In a real short form, God has a place of service for you. This text speaks of two anointed men, two totally different outcomes. You know, Samuel anointed both of these men. God chose both of these men. And now to you and me, we have a choice, don't we? Who will we be more like? Will, be, will the final thing said about you and me be more like David? Will it be more like Saul? On the surface, there seemed to be nothing about David that would have impressed God. Look at this picture. I see him as a tough, dirty little kid when he started out. I love that picture so much because it shows how tough a young man can really be. David had to be tough from an early age. Nothing caused him, caused God to say about David, wow, that's my man. David didn't look much different than any other Jewish boy of, his, of that age. Samuel simply said he was ruddy with beautiful eyes and had a handsome appearance. David's outward appearance didn't seem to set him apart in any way. He was nothing more than a shepherd and a very young one at that. He lived in a little village of Bethlehem, yet God said in effect, you have what I'm looking for. You will be the next king of Israel. You know, it's funny. His own father didn't even think of including him until Samuel asked, are these all your sons? And suddenly, this young nobody became a somebody. Would it surprise you to learn that other than Christ, more has been written about David than any other character in the Bible? Abraham had 14 chapters written about him, as well as Joseph. Jacob had 11 chapters written about him. Elijah had 10. Do you have any idea this morning how many books were written about David? You have a chance to, to join in. Anyone have a guess? 160. Edward's very aggressive. Anyone else? 66 books about him. And that's not even including 59 references to him in the New Testament. When you realize how much is said about David in the scriptures, coupled with the fact that on two occasions he is specifically called a man after God's own heart you could get the feeling that he was some sort of super phenomenal person, wouldn't you? Well, far from it. He was dirty, tough, little shepherd boy, wasn't he?
So, I don't want you to get the wrong idea why God chose David or why he chooses anyone for that matter. You know, he also chose Saul, a tall, handsome guy. That's probably the kind of guy you and I would choose if God asked us to choose the next leader. So why does God choose people? Or perhaps the question should be, what kind of people does God choose to use? People throughout the ages have tended to choose their leaders based on their brains, their brawn, and their beauty, much like Saul was chosen. But God says, that's not the way I make my choices. I choose the nobodies and turn them into somebodies. And that, in a nutshell, is the story of the life of David. I think there are three priorities for God's anointed servants. And we're going to try to look at some of those this morning. When God scans the earth for potential servant leaders, he is not on a search for angels in the flesh. He is certainly not looking for perfect people, since as far as I know, there are none of them. He is searching for men and women like you and me, mere people made up of flesh. But he is also looking for certain qualities in people, the same qualities that he found in David, the same qualities that you and I must learn to possess. The first quality he saw in David was spirituality. What does it mean to be a person after God's own heart? Seems to me it means that you are a person whose life is in harmony with the Lord. What is important to him is important to you. What burdens him burdens you. When he says, go to the right, you go to the right. When he says, stop that in your life, you stop it. When he says, this is wrong and I want you to change, you come to terms with it because you have the heart of God. That's bottom line biblical Christianity. That's something Saul had, had, but it's something Saul lost. When you are deeply spiritual, you have a heart that is sensitive to the things of God. For the eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth, and he, that he may strongly support those whose heart is completely his. I love those words. Strongly support. Do you think each of you are strongly supported by God? Amen. You are. Anything you do for him, you are strongly supported. So again, what is God looking for? He is looking for men and women whose heart are completely his. And I mean completely. That means that when you do wrong, you admit it. And immediately, immediately come to terms with it. You're grieved over your wrongs. You're concerned about things that displease God. You long to please him in your actions. That's true spiritually, and that is definitely the first quality that David had. The second quality God saw in David was humility. The Lord said to Samuel, Fill your horn with oil, and go, I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have selected a king for myself from among his sons. The Lord had gone to the home of Jesse and spotted Jesse's son and said, in effect, that is my man. Why? Because the Lord saw in David a heart that was completely his. The boy was faithfully keeping his father's sheep. God saw humility. He saw a servant's heart. If you want further confirmation on this, all you have to do is open your Bibles 
turn to the book of Psalms and just start reading anywhere. You'll see the heart of David. It is as if God says, I don't care about all that slick public image business. Show me a person who has the character, and I will give him all the image that he needs. I don't care if he, he doesn't have a lot of charisma. I don't care about his size. I don't care about an impressive track record. I care about character. First is the person deeply authentic in his or her spiritual walk. Secondly, is he or she a servant? When you have a servant's heart, you are humble. You do as you are told. You don't rebel. You serve faithfully. That's David. God looked at David out in the field surrounding Bethlehem, keeping his father's sheep, faithfully doing his father's bidding. It should also be noted that a servant doesn't care who gets the glory. A servant has one great goal, and that is to make the person he serves look better. I think about that when I, I started biking. I always try to bring in things that I do. And one thing one of my friends told me, he says, when you're biking, you don't show people how good you are. You show them how good they are by working with them and helping them. And I've always kind of remembered that. It's so useful in so many parts of our, our life. A servant does not what the person he, he, person he serves, he does not want the person that he serves to fail. So while David's brothers were off in the army, making rank, fighting the big battles for, for Israel, David was all alone, keeping the sheep. He possessed a servant's heart. The third quality David had, I think, was integrity. So turn with me in your Bibles. Open up Psalm 78 with me. We're going to read verses 71 and 72 together. Psalm 78, 71, and 72. I love how this verse just fell right in here with this. From the care of the ewes with suckling lambs he brought him to shepherd Jacob his people in Israel his inheritance. So he shepherded them according to his integrity, to the integrity of his heart, and guided them with his skillful hands. This not only shows the integrity of David, but it also foretold the ministry. Of Christ. So circle right here, if you're writing any notes down, integrity. That is so significant. God is now looking for magnificent specimens of humanity. He is looking for deeply spiritual, genuinely humble, honest, and to the core servants who have integrity. Integrity is what you are when nobody's looking. It means being bone deep honest. Have you ever met anyone that was bone deep honest? They were almost irritating at first, weren't they? You try to say something funny, they don't laugh because they're thinking true honesty. You're thinking, well, we'll make a joke a little bit here, but they're thinking, they'll come back with you with a true honest answer, and I think it's always good to see those type of people. Today, we live in a world that says, in many ways, if you just make a good impression, that's all that matters. But you will never be the man or woman of God if that is your philosophy. Never. He is not impressed with externals. He always focuses on inward qualities, those things that take time and discipline to cultivate. No one is born with all of these qualities. Isn't that nice to know? <laughs> they must be developed. So, God has methods for training his servants to have these qualities. In this regard, it is enlightening to me to see how God trained David 
for a leadership role. His early training ground was, what do you think it was? When you're thinking, I should have the children. What's an early training ground for God's king? Where would you start training him? In the, in, in the palace? That's not the way God saw it, was it? I have a small list. The best place that God sees for training you. One list in the lonely places. In the obscure places. In the monotonous places. In the places where you had to be real. Let's describe each of these disciplines or training grounds. First, we're going to look at solitude. He needed to learn life's major lessons all alone before he could be trusted with responsibilities and rewards before a public people. Bethlehem is situated in six miles to the south of Jerusalem by the main road leading to Hebron. Its site is 2,000 feet above the level of the Mediterranean on the eastern slopes of a long gray ridge with a deep valley on either side. These unite at some little distance to the east and run down towards the Dead Sea. What a difference. See that? The Holy Land is just beautiful. I've never been there, but I can imagine the, the change of terrain and the way it looks. On the gentle slopes of the hills, the figs, olives, and grapevines grow luxuriously. And in the valleys are the rich cornfields where Ruth once gleaned. The moorlands around Bethlehem form the greater part of the Judean plateau. Do not, however, present features of soft beauty, but are wild, gaunt, and strong. Character breeding at land. There, shepherds have always led and watched their flocks. And there, David first absorbed the knowledge of natural scenery and the pastoral pursuits which schooled all his afterlife and even his poetry. Solitude has nourishing, qual nourishing, nourishing qualities all its own. If you can stand to be alone with yourself, you have deep, if you cannot stand to be alone with yourself, you have deep, unresolved conflicts in your inner life. Solitude has a way of helping us address those issues. When was the last time you got along with nature and soaked it in? So, al so alone that the sound of silence seemed deafening. You know, I look at this picture and I think back of some of my backpacking days. I loved the backpack, the Appalachian Trail. There's a mountain that I like to get on. It's called Obald. And you get on the top, there's no trees, there's nothing. And you can look off in every direction and you see the lights. You see the land, especially at sundown or sunrise. And you start to realize how small you really are in that place and how you are there just with God. And he can speak to you, me there on that, that nice and lonely area. Well, that's kind of the area where David lived and worked as a young child. That's where he first learned to be king. For many nights, he sat alone under the stars. He felt the blustery winds of autumn and the cold winds of winter. He learned to endure the burning rays of the summer sun. Solitude was one of the teachers God used as he trained young David for the throne. Second, David grew up in obscurity. That's another way God trains his personnel in obscurity. Men and women of God, servant leaders in making, are first totally unknown, unseen, unappreciated, unapplauded. In the relentless demands of obscurity, character is built. Strange as it may seem, those who first accept the silence of obscurity are best qualified to handle the applause of popularity. This leads us to one more training ground, monotony. That's being faithful 
in the meaningful, insignificant routine, rather unexciting, uneventful daily task of life. Life without a break. Just plain L-I-F-E life. Just constant, unchanging, endless hours of tired monotony. As you learn to be a man of, or woman of God with nobody else around, when nobody else notices, when nobody else even cares, that's how we learn to be God's servants. That brings us to the fourth training ground, reality. Up until now, you might have been have the feeling that despite the solitude, obscurity, and monotony, David was just sitting around on some hilltop in mystic haze, composing a great piece of music, or relaxing the pasture of Judea, and even having a great time teaching those sheep how to stand on their hind legs. That's not true. Think ahead with me now, again, to 1 Samuel 17. Here is David standing by Saul as a giant lumbers across the distant landscape. Yeah, remember Saul? Great big guy? Now, scared to death, knees knocking, inside his tent, hiding from Goliath. Do you want to find yourself in that predicament? when you had had so much offered to you by God. And then there's, here's little David saying, let's go whip that giant. Saul looks at him. He says, who are you? And he directly says, I'm David. Saul says, well, where have you been trained? I've been with my father's sheep. I can see Saul laughing right now. So watching those sheep, you're ready to attack this giant. You can't fight a Philistine. You're just a kid, and you have absolutely no experience. But here's what I love about David. He didn't hesitate for one moment. He says to Saul, your servant was tending his father's sheep. Now notice again, he was in a place of, of solitude, obscurity, and monotony when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb from the flock. That again is reality. I went out after him and attacked him and rescued it from his mouth. And when he rose up against me, I seized him by his beard and struck him and killed him. Where did David get such courage? He learned it all alone with God. What kind of man is this David? He's truly a man of reality. He's a man who remained responsible when nobody was looking. So this guy Goliath, says David, I'm not worried about him. Goliath was no big deal. Why? Because David had been killing lions and bears while nobody was around. He had been facing reality long before he, he went off against Goliath. Somehow, we've gotten the idea that getting along with God is unrealistic. That is not the real world. Getting alone with God doesn't mean you sit in some closet and think about infinity. No, it means you get alone and discover how to be more responsible and diligent in all areas of your life, whether it means fighting your lions or your bears or simply, simply following orders. That's why I have a problem with this new kind of thinking of, of a deeper life. Teaching, that, teaching things that say you should stand back and God does everything for you. Well, I'm going to be honest with you. I've never had God fix a flat tire for me. Neither did David. He rolled up his sleeves, 
and he fought for the sheep. It was in such scenes of reality that David learned to be the king. Dare I say, we must fight for the salvation of others as well as ourselves. David may have lived many centuries ago, but the things we can learn from him are as current as the sunrise this morning. Two stand out in my mind as we draw to a close this morning. First, it is the little things that in the lonely places that we can prove ourselves capable of big things. If you want to be the person with a large vision, you must cultivate a habit of doing little things very well. I love your story. God works in mysterious ways. He makes sure you gave an illustration of what my talk was about. I love the way God works. You know, what I was talking about, that's when God will put iron in your bones is when you do those things. And secondly, when God develops our inner qualities, remember, he's never, ever in a hurry. The conversion of a soul is the miracle of a moment. The manufacture of a saint is a task of a lifetime. When God develops character, he works on it throughout a lifetime. He's never in a hurry. Reading Psalms, reading the Old Testament, David continued to grow throughout his life, didn't he? He learned a lot of tough lessons, just like you and I have to learn. That's reality. It's in the schoolroom of solitude and obscurity that we learn to become men and women of God. It is from the schoolmasters of monotony and reality that we learn to be shepherds of God's lost sheep. That's how we become, I think, like David, men and women after God's own heart. How many people in Scripture were taught just this way? Abraham, Joseph, Moses, John the Baptist, and even Christ, an unknown carpenter. I'm going back to my comp class again. I've told you what I was going to say. I've told you about it. Now I'm going to tell you what I told you. So if you didn't get it in the first two, you're going to get it now. Last thought. God wants to anoint you to his service. Just as he did David. Just as he did Abraham. Isaac. Jacob. Joseph. Moses and even Rahab. Open your Bibles with me again to the book of Hebrews. We're going to look at chapter 11. Most of you know Hebrews chapter 11, but I don't think you've looked at it with this kind of mindset. We think of it as, oh, look at these people with great faith. But we didn't think about how did they get that great faith. Now we know, don't we? I'm going to start with, with 11.32. And what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak and of Samson and of Jesus and David also and Samuel and of the prophets who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouth of lions. Is there anything you and I cannot do if we are trained by God. Nothing. Quench the violence of fire. Escape the edge of the sword. Out of weakness were made strong. Waxed valiant in fight. Turn to fight the enemies of the alien. Again, is there anything anyone here thinks they cannot do without God? Then we have no reason to say that, right? Let's skip down to, to chapter 12. I want to read the first part of that. It finishes it for us. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sins which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking into Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, 
who for the joy was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Amen. Are you developing the qualities that God has given you? Think through that this afternoon when you get home. Are you willing to face the realities of this world? And we all know what those realities are. They don't look pretty at this time, do they? But we also know what we just read. God sees you through every minute and every second of it. Are you someone who could be anointed by God to his service? I think anyone here who hears what I'm saying or on the internet knows that he can be a part of God's service or should know it. So I want each of you to think about that as I do myself. I've had to think about all this week. I had all kinds of excuses of why I couldn't be someone God could use. There's, I ran out of numbers because I couldn't count that far. <laughs> but when you finish thinking about it, there is no excuse, is there? No excuse at all for not letting God work on our lives and change us to be like we should be. Let's bow our heads as we pray.